Hello and welcome to another episode of Destination Yuri. And today we're joined by uh, two eminent guests, uh, two local historians. Uh, I have uh, Kevin Murphy on my left here and he's joined also by Una Walsh. And they've come in from the parish of Mullaban uh, to talk to us about a seminal period uh, in our history, uh, the famine period uh, from which ran from 1844 and um, in particular the South Armagh area uh, suffered uh, during that, that period and emigration uh, was rife then and of course uh, with the, the port here in Uri and Warren Point as well a lot of local people left the area and we're going to look at a, at a cameo from that period which was the, the sailing of the ill-fated Hannah and uh, the fate of the, the, the passengers uh, on border. And um, Kevin and Una are going to tell us that story, uh, the, the, the very tragic story, and also take an overview of what, like, what life was like uh, in that period uh, in our history um, and what drove these people to leave their, their homeland and literally head on a, a, an unknown journey uh, to the far side of the world. So, Kevin, yourself and Una have written a book, uh, A Famine Link, The Hannah. Now, I said that The Hannah had left Warren Point uh, in April um, 1849, wasn't it? And... Um, Maybe you could maybe you could fill us in from there, Kevin. Well, the background to the sailing, of course, uh, was the famine from um, the well starvation, basically uh, from eighteen forty five uh, failure of the potato crop, and then by eighteen forty nine, uh, a lot of people uh, were 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 getting out. Well, they were the ones who had some money uh, to pay the, the the shipping agent. Uh, and um, like for example in uh, South Armagh we hear of the west of Ireland that the, the famine was very bad there and of course we hear about Skibbereen and all that kind of thing but um, in uh, South Armagh in the barony of Orier and the Fews uh, it was lamentable destitution and um, the landlords uh, with one or two exceptions were particularly harsh and um, Therefore, uh, a lot of people both died and emigrated. Uh, from 1841 until 1971, the parish of Mullaban, which is officially the parish of Fark Hill, lost 70% of its population. So uh, it, was, it was an appalling uh, thing. Uh, I think from 1841 to uh, 1861, in those 20 years, um, there were something like two thousand uh, six hundred and some odd people uh, disappeared from from the parish and that would be uh, basically more than the population of the parish now so um, it was it was a fearful time uh, and the people who went on the ships were the ones who could afford to pay some money you know mm -hmm. uh, now there was a bit of um, we talked earlier uh, una about the the actual departure date of the ship and uh, even even with that, there's a suggestion that uh, before even these unfortunates left Warren Point, they could have been exploited. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, I think it would have all been exploitation. I mean, Kevin talked about the famine years and about the landlords. And, I mean, it's not that it hasn't been documented because Reverend Gunn Brown, who would have been a Church of Ireland minister, um, give give submissions to the Devon Commission about the landlords of South Armagh, which was a people stepping out, if you like, out of his own tradition to say that. And he said the landlords of South Armagh were exterminators. So that was that was your first Exterm base. Exterminators. exterminators. So that was your first base, and that 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 really the people were in that situation where at all levels they had been exploited. So that when they came to the Hannah, when they came to Warren Point, the Hannah itself was an exploitation because it was a coal boat. You know, it was a boat that came in carrying a cargo of coal. The coal was taken off and that's what you put people back into, as you said, for an unknown journey. And, and to say then that you were maybe 
I had a starting date that was delayed for three or four days where people were having to stay in Warren Point, they were having to pay money, so how much collusion there was then between the people who owned those houses and the master of the ship. And really, masters of ships seem to be almost uh, able to make all decisions in their own right. Mm -hmm. It was his jurisdiction. He decided when the boat would go, so, mm. so he, could, he could set that all up. So, you know, those people, and as Kevin said, the people who left, maybe um, even though it, it, be, it was an ill-fated journey, um, they were maybe the luckier ones in that they had some means to, to allow them to leave. Now, um, we talked there about the landlords, and Kevin, we know about... Um, we know about Jackson in Farkell and we know about Chambry and Make. Um, who else was involved? Well, Jackson actually, uh, it was the Jackson estate, but by the time uh, of the, this period, uh, it was the Alexander family had it taken. It was uh, leased out to them by the um, Jackson Charitable Bequest, which he left after he died in 1787. Um, Incidentally, the landlord at the time that these people left uh, was Henry Alexander. And uh, interestingly, uh, we discovered later than the book, actually, uh, he and his wife and daughters were uh, on holiday in Bologna uh, as these people sailed out. So um, it, most of the people in the parish of Fark Hill were the landlord was uh, the Alexanders of Fark Hill. Um, there were a few others, the Johnsons, they had the townland of Mafona, the Johnsons of Carrick Broad. Um, Carrick Negevna now townland was, uh, it was the, uh, uh, the, the, the Whaley family of Stephen's Green, uh, Buck Whaley's people. Um, and cousins. if you go to yeah. Temple Bar, there is still a nightclub uh, uh, called, called Buck Whaley's. Yeah, and they owned Temple Bar and they owned uh, the port of Clyde and Galway and so on. Uh, the original Richard, Richard Whaley uh, was a cousin of Oliver Cromwell, so he got a <laughs> large slice, 20,000 acres in Wicklow <laughs> and the Central people, Bar. People, the people, Kevin, of a good pedigree. Uh, he was of a good pedigree, <laughs> Richard Whaley, and then his descendant, uh, also Richard Whaley uh, in the 1760s, he was Richard Chapel Whaley, he was known as Burn Chapel Whaley because he was very zealous at burning Popish chapels. Uh, so uh, they were the landlords of Cairdney Gavin and then of course you had um, uh, Andoff and uh, uh, McGill Bond. Yeah, McGill Bond family uh, of Armagh, notoriously harsh landlords as well. And, um, of course, Shumbry was over the mountain uh, a little bit, uh, and, um, but he was a byword for, for uh, uh, repression in, uh, in the, the, this period, in the famine period. Mm -hmm. He said, for example, that Meredith Shumbry said he would leave a race of a horse between the houses on his estate. Uh, in other words, he would thin the people out. Mm -hmm. And fair play to him, he, he managed. But to look at the extent of the difference in people, in Bassett's Guide uh, for Armagh for 1888, there's a piece that says Captain Granville Alexander had spent between seven and eight thousand pounds in renovating his extensive residence for Kill Lodge. Now, this is 1888, that's 40 years post famine, he spent between seven and eight thousand pounds. You know, and you think about the living conditions yeah. and what, what the people on those estates, how they were living. And there's like, like the, the magnitude of the gap between what was the landlord people and, and the, the peasant people is absolutely enormous. And you're, you, you painted a picture there, Una, of the, the, the enormous gap and the almost obscene uh, wealth that these people had uh, while while their 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 uh, tenants uh, were living in such squalor, but actually, Kevin, could you could you give us a picture of what life would have been like for these unfortunates, in at this time? Yeah, well, you I mean the farms were uh, very small. I mean, a, 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 a fairly a big farm would have been ten acres, and then of course most of them were three, four acres. Some of them one acres, you know. And of course, the uh, labourers and cottiers were were below that, and uh, 
uh, they weren't basically able to get on a boat. I mean, they, 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 they had absolutely nothing because they depended for payment uh, from the farmers and they were paid in potatoes and so on mm. and they had a little garden but when the potatoes failed uh, you see the people couldn't uh, look after themselves so the labour or cottier class they were the ones who, who, who suffered most but when the people uh, the people of the, of the sort of small farmer class who went on the Hannah uh, could probably scrape up a few pounds but uh, Basically, uh, well, we, we know uh, the first year that we can get any inkling of what life expectancy was in the parish is 1864 now, which is a bit after the famine. And uh, in 1864, uh, I discovered that um, life expectancy was 38 years in the parish of Fork Hill. Gosh. And the next year, it actually went down to 37 years and four months. So, you know, we think now, and this was like, we're talking about um, 13 years, uh, what, 1864 would be 15 years after the, the Hannah. Yeah. So that was the, the, the horror of that. I mean, um, it, that was the legacy. Yes, in 1865, 24 children under the age of five died in the parish of Farkhill. Now, you're talking about two a month. I mean, it, it, it's just an appalling situation. So uh, that's the only reason we can get a picture because that was the first registry of deaths. Mm -hmm. So we can only speculate at how awful it was. I mean, people were going to the graveyards um, and, and digging shallow graves and lying down in them uh, because uh, they felt that their relatives would be too weak to, uh, to dig graves when they died. And they shut themselves up in their houses. I have a few cases of that in our parish where they shut themselves up and just uh, closed the door and died. Literally gave up. They gave up, yes. They gave up. Uh, and um, several accounts of uh, people being um, uh, dead along the road. Uh, two accounts. Uh, one of them is my great-grandmother. Uh, two children arrived at her door. That would be uh, during the famine period. Well, she was married in 1845, just in time for the famine. So uh, these two children, their names were Michael Heron, and they came and she gave them oaten bread. But they wandered off. They were last seen eating cabbage roots in a garden uh, at the end of my uh, loaning uh, in Carrick and Gavin, and they were never seen again. They wandered away. But funnily enough, the father and mother, uh, they, he was a, a, a linen weaver, and uh, they survived. Another case is in Drummond Tea, the three steps in Drummond Tea, there was a servant girl there, she was Mackay from a phoner um, in Fork Hill Parish and um, there was somebody sick in the house and she was being set up, uh, sent up to the chapel in Drummond Tea for holy water and she was afraid to go and somebody said to her, ah, don't, don't worry, there are only eight coffins in the chapel tonight. I was in Drummond Tea uh, Church. So that gives you some picture of picture. the horror of the thing. You, know? you see, Una, I think that uh, in Newry, um, we we were spared the worst of it because, as you know, uh, Newry was beginning uh, to benefit from the the uh, industrial revolution, uh, and we had we had a lot of. Uh, uh, employment and and it was a commercial it the the town was growing as a commercial entity it was and you had the ship canal that had started you had you had that what that had created you also had the viaduct and you had the railway starting to, mm -hmm. to bring stuff in and, and you're talking about an area like south armagh which was a completely rural area and i mean you know even to go to the 1901 census which has taken you 50 years almost um, over over the famine and go in to, to look at the census because the census material will give you so much more of a social history mm -hmm. than just the family names. Yes. You know, it'll give you the housing stock, it'll give you the social standing of the houses, it will give you whether they're attached. You know, if you go into most of the townlands that are in that South Armagh area, you know, you're talking about maybe three, four houses out of that whole townland that might have anything other than attached roof. Mm. 
you know, so you're going back and at a time that... So it was ob abject poverty. Yeah, and that's that's into the 1900s, you know, into another century yeah, almost yeah. after the famine. But but the whole thing of the land issue and the fact that if people were on a, a, on a piece of land, that if you did any work to that land, that what the landlord did was, instead of recompensing that, to put the rent up. Do you know that that's how the whole thing grew up around the land struggle and the agrarian struggle? It grew up because of that tenure of fixture of tenure yeah. and the fact that that um, you were you were actually in a worse place by by trying to better yourself. Yeah, the more work that the you, more did, you did, did instead the of the more you did, the more you were penalised. Yeah which yeah. is where the whole land situation came from and was one of the reasons why Reverend Gunn Brown was so was so firm in his standing against the landlords yeah. because there is absolutely no doubt that he was a pacifist and he didn't support any type of insurrection against it. He was speaking purely on a charitable issue, mm -hmm. which, which, if you like, gives it absolutely more standing. You know, because he's not coming from that background of having a axe to grind or, or being personally involved in it. Um, so, you know, it, it, the, I think the South Arm area, because of all of that, of course, Newry was going to be in a slightly different place. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, at, at the same time, um, the South Arm story, I, I suppose, is a story that um, still continues to this day in, in it being a rural identity. Mm -hmm. You know, slightly different, but still very much a rural area. And if you like, almost that sort of a place apart, being so close to an urban centre. I would nearly, I would nearly get the impression, you know, that you, you're, you're saying uh, that uh, you're almost marginalised. Uh, well, marginalised in, in some ways and um, maybe culturally protected in other ways. Yeah, that, yeah. That, um, it left us with what we have largely unchanged mm -hmm. and protected mm -hmm. um, uh, until, certainly until the time that people appreciated what that was. Yeah, maybe. yeah. Um, you know, I think of some of the fine buildings that had been in Uri when I came to school in Uri first, um, that are no longer oh, there. Oh, yeah. And that should have been protected. Terrible. Yeah, and sometimes... Um, Swathes of the town actually gone. Yeah, sometimes remoteness is, uh, creates its own benefits. Yeah, oh, no doubt. Well, Kevin, uh, you've painted a, a picture, and, and Una has just coloured in as well, of the situation uh, that the, the, the desperate plight that these people were faced with. And could you talk us through then how how someone would have made the decision uh, to to go for a, a famine ship that they would have finally decided I have to get out of here. Yeah, well, by the time they went, you see, the the path had already been cleared. I mean, Newry was full of shipping agents. Mm -hmm. uh, they booked with Ferguson of of Merchant Quay. Mm -hmm. uh, James McMahon's uh, shipping agents is still there beside Goss's garage. There. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the one and then there were a few more that still exist along the quay there and um, uh, the shipping agents were there well now these people were going to Quebec but they were going to an area uh, Perth Westport area in Ontario uh, but people were going from uh, the South Alma area to there from the 1820s and uh, I think we've identified uh, who went first. Uh, it was actually a, a man called Shane McDermott and he was quite well off but went for different reasons. So by the time they were going there was an established group there. So they knew where they were going to. Um, sort of unfortunately yeah. like our young yes. people going to yeah. New York exactly and Perth. Exactly They're going the to where there is an Irish community yeah. and more so a local one if they have it, which mm -hmm. they did have yeah. um, going. So, yeah, the, you go to your own. Mm. Yeah. So there were 20 families from the parish of Arkell represented on this ship. Now, the organisation of it, obviously, uh, they must have met, they must have uh, coordinated the whole thing, and then they would have walked to, to the port. Now, when they got to the port... And you see, we didn't know this story, but the story came down, an old woman called Annie Quinn, who was a cousin of my mother's uh, from Carrie Gavna, and she told the story, uh, she lived to be uh, almost 106 years old. And uh, incidentally, the last 
speaker of Irish in South Armagh that she got from her, her, her people. Uh, and when, when did Annie pass away? 1997. Uh, she was born on the day Parnell was buried. Uh, in, um, uh, so she uh, told the story. But the reason that knew, we knew anything about the story was that um, her grandmother was a, a, a woman called Catherine Grant from the townland of Tully McCreeve. And her brother, Henry Grant, went on this ship. But the story that came down in Carrickna was that um, this family, Grant family, had five children. And when they went to the port, now we didn't know where the port was, um, the eldest girl who was 12 and had spent a lot of her time down with her aunt Catherine Grant, who was married to Ned Quinn of Carrickna Gavna, my mother's people, and um, she refused to go. And she held on to um, uh, Ned Quinn, who was a brother of my great-grandfather. And she cried and cried and wouldn't go. And eventually they allowed her to stay. So she came back to Carrickna Gavna with her aunt mm -hmm. and uh, his, uh, her husband. And whenever the ship hit the ice, the other four children were drowned. And the story came back because of this girl. And the story was that uh, the wife uh, bound her husband's feet uh, with her uh, petticoat. It was a platen petticoat. It was hard linen. Uh, she got it in strips and, and bound his feet. And she reckoned that that's what saved them while they were out on the ice. So the, this girl, word must have come back eventually, and this girl went out to them three years later. Now, we knew this, but we didn't know where the boat was coming uh, from or sailing to. Mm -hmm. It was only in 2003 when a man called Paddy Murphy and his wife Jane from um, Ontario arrived with myself and Una and he said I'm Paddy Murphy and I'm looking for my ancestors and there he had the list and uh, of passengers and immediately there was Henry Grant and wife four children lost and I knew immediately it was the same ship. So the little bit fragment of the, the oral the story had come down and uh, it linked up immediately and of course it was the... And, the and I think, you know, if there's one lesson to be learned from from the doing of the Hannah, it, it is about that oral tradition, that the most valuable thing you have in any area is that oral tradition and the fact that stories were handed on because only that piece of story, when, we, when, when Paddy Murphy came first, we were just finishing off a book because we had put in Townland Stones and we were finishing off a book around the Townland and we thought, right, do we stick in one page about this, just have some record of it, and then it didn't naturally fit. It was, it was a water story, if you like, and all our stories in the other book were land stories because they were all townlands. And it, we didn't know where it would fit in and one wouldn't help the other and we left it to one side. But, the, but it, it, it burned, it sort of burned then because it was there then and you needed to do something with it. But only that fragment of the oral tradition was there. When Paddy Murphy came, only that was there, it never would have been followed on. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that Canada had much better records um, than us was a great help and it, the book couldn't have happened only for the information that Paddy Murphy and Jane were able to bring with them and, and quite a lot of research that they had already done mm -hmm. on their side. Um, but the other important thing was that the book couldn't have happened either, only that the parish of Fork Hill had an 1821 census. So that the people that were that were appearing on the ship's manifest in 1849, that we could actually place them in their town lands with the correct ages and all in the 1821 census. So if that oral tradition had to be in another parish, even though the, the proper even though the rest of the information came from Canada, you still couldn't you may have published a book, but it would have been purely an anecdotal Dokered, book. Yeah that you could not have stood over, but we could actually make it an absolute certainty by having the 1820. Cross-referencing. And cross-referencing. And but Kevin, the oral tradition was the key. And Kevin, would you expound on what Una has just told us? Would you explain to the, to the viewers watching this the significance of that 1821 census? 
Well, I mean, this is an amazing document. Uh, there are only about 18 parishes in Ireland have any, some of them only fragments. Uh, there's only one full uh, 1821 census uh, in the six counties here, and that's Derry, Vollen, and Fermanagh. Um, fragments of Kilmore, County Armagh, but that's it. And none at all in Munster exist. But um, luckily enough, uh, this copy was kept uh, in the boardroom of the Jackson Charitable Bequest in uh, Fork Hill. And eventually uh, we got our hands on it and we were able to, to, to copy it in the original handwriting. But um, as an historian from Derry said to me, uh, Bobby Forrest, uh, he said he was very jealous of this and he <laughs> said, uh, this is like shining a torch into the dark. You know, by looking at the 1821 census, we were able to get back to people who were born in the 1760s. So it was a massive document, and the younger children then were appearing in uh, Ontario. And when you looked at the census of Ontario, not just uh, as well as the boat, uh, but when we broadened it out, these people were appearing, and then we found them dying out there and what they did and so on. So. Um, it was a, a massive uh, document, so that when we looked at pictures from out there, for example, James Ward and his wife, Mary McKinley. Now, they weren't sure out there if that uh, was, uh, was, was him or his son. And then um, we knew Mary McKinley was from Clarkel and he was from the townland of Mafona, uh, which were adjoining townlands. And uh, when I brought the picture, they sent over the picture from Canada. When I brought the picture to my aunt, who was born in 1917, she's still alive. Uh, and um, she immediately looked at the picture and I said, do you recognize any of the faces? And she said, well, I don't know the man, but the woman has a McKinley face on her. <laughs> so this verified the situation. And um, so that we were able to then... Um, clearly showed that this was Mary McKinley and this was James Ward. James Ward was pretty heroic uh, when the ship hit the ice. He uh, was very athletic and he jumped back and forward from the ship to the ice and, and back and forward and rescued a lot of children out of oh. the ice. So the 1821 census was absolutely uh, crucial. crucial. And of course, it's crucial because uh, when we get the Registry of Deaths, which started in 1864, we can trace these people dying here, and of course, with better records in Canada and the states, we can we can uh, trace them out there. Very so good. it's an invaluable document, right? But, and even on a wider context, you know, it means that children that are in our parish mm. can trace their people if they know that the, if they know that their people have always been there. They can move now from 2013, they can move back through census material, they can go online, get 1911, 1901 census material, they can go into Griffith's valuation also online in 1864, that'll show their people there, they have an 1821 census. So a child in our parish can go back into the 1700s with their own people, uh. you know, without leaving the house. You know, and, and all of this, all of that sort of value mat material being stored in pronate, which of course is good and it should be stored. But the important thing is that local children, that children are involved in all of this, that children uh, can see where, where their own lineage are coming from and that they can do that themselves. And it, it also highlights, you know, in a present day situation, the absolute importance of townlands and of people being part of their own community, community and knowing their own community. Do you know that and having, stories, having a sense of identity. Yes, but, but yes, and knowing the people that were around them and, and the importance of that for young people in, in feeling a sense of pride in themselves and who they are. Because the one thing as you go globally and we talked about immigration and the fact that we are now back in the situation that the famine link was in where we are exporting our young people all of the time. The one thing that no matter where you go that's unique to you is the core of yourself. And that's your own genetic makeup and the makeup of the people that, that surrounded you, that nurtured you, that got you to where you are. So townlands, if you like, you know, the oral tradition was the link of the Hannah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the link of all of that is your townlands and your sense of who those are and where they are. So, Kevin, we have uh, 
the 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 immigrants have walked from we'll say Mullaban to Warren Point. They've boarded the ship. Uh, we know that it was a coal boat. Uh, we know that um, the 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 they'd converted the ship with bunks etc to take the people back. So would you give us a picture, Kevin, of the conditions that these people uh, would have been afforded when they went on board the ship, uh, starting with the number of people who actually travelled. Yes, well, there were there were uh, upwards of two hundred people on the on the ship for a start. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, according to the records, there were one hundred and twenty seven saved and about fifty five lost uh, on on the ice. You know, either drowned or frozen to death. Um, but the, the ship itself was, was a horror, of course. The, the below decks was, was very low, and this was a, a coal boat from uh, Mary Port in um, Cumbria. And um, it was captained by a, a gentleman called Curry Shaw. I think, I think yeah. we'll say gentleman, say gentleman, gentleman in, in inverted, correct, uh, inverted uh, gentleman commas. In very much inverted commas. He was 22 years old, but. Um, the account that we got later uh, from, from other people, because other people turned up uh, with accounts even after the book, um, but um, uh, he was one day out of uh, Warren Pint and they had three uh, wooden latrines and he threw them overboard. Um, the, he, he kept the hatches down and the people were uh, confined below deck. In the hold? Yes, and he basically... Uh, he was. There's also record of him attacking some of the young women. Uh, an account was given by a, a Mrs. Murphy. She was the um, ancestor of this Paddy Murphy who came. Yeah. And she testified that he was he was uh, attacking the, the women in their bunks and so on. So um, he was a notorious character. So that uh, when they left on the third or fifth of April, uh, there's variance about the date. It was booked to go on the first of April. So. He may have been in collusion with some of the work boarding mm -hmm. houses in Warren Pint, as was usual uh, for for this type of thing. But um, when they um, hit the ice on the 29th of, of April uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, on the back of the book they have a big uh, iceberg type thing. And it, it, it wouldn't have been, it was pack ice, it wouldn't yeah. have been that high. Uh, but... Um, uh, when they, they ran into it at about 4.30 in the morning, um, the ship went down in about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he and the first and second mate jumped into one of the longboats and took off. Um, he, he, he grabbed the ship's log and uh, compass and so on. And as he was coming out, he shouted, keep quiet and I will save you all. But he was really actually uh, jumping into the, the boat. Now, the ship's surgeon, he was a surgeon Graham from McGilligan in Derry. And it's kind of interesting that his brother was the perpetual curate in the Church of Ireland in Mai, St. Luke's in Mai, at the time. And he dived into the water to try and stop them leaving. But um, uh, Captain Curry Shaw uh, lashed at him with a cutlass. He broke his ankle, jumping onto the ice to try and stop them. And the passengers pulled him back onto the ice. So they were out on the ice from 4.30 odd in the morning. Most of them were in night attire, so they were in a terrible state. And um, uh, it was five o'clock that evening when they were spied uh, by a ship called the Nicaragua with a Captain William Marshall. Um, he was uh, from a place called Clovelly in Devon. His house is still there, incidentally. And um, he, he spied them uh, on the ice. And, um, and he was a gentleman. He was, he was an amazing character. He was an evangelical Methodist. And he was one of those rare things. He was and actually was a Christian, you know. Uh -huh. And um, he uh, uh, said he was he was pulling in to, to rescue them, and his crew virtually mutinied because the danger of losing their own ship. Yeah. Uh, but he had a false bow, uh, which he, he he let down on chains, uh, you know, to to protect against the ice. So eventually, he persuaded the crew, and he has his autobiography has since turned up. And he's very interested in account of the rescue and so on. And um, eventually uh, he pulled in, but his ship was holed and he had to move the cargo uh, to tip it up so that the carpenter could repair uh, the, the hole in the side of the ship 
before he could rescue anyone. Mm -hmm. Then he put down ladders and, and ropes for them, but he discovered that they couldn't, they were so cold, numbed with numbed, the cold, yeah. uh, and he had to lasso them, sometimes two or three at a time, and he got them around the waist, sometimes around the, the, the ankles, and hauled them on board. And um, he has a horrifying account of, of what happened there, you know. So one captain was an absolute vagabond, he took off, mm -hmm. and the one who came was a amazing man. Now to get back to um, the, the, the surgeon Graham and you mentioned the uh, perpetual curate his brother in May uh, and it seems that, that he, had a, he had an affinity with the passengers because Graham the surgeon because of his brother he had a type of affinity hadn't he? Yes it would seem so but he was an amazingly heroic man yeah, yeah. And, and when he got to uh, Quebec uh, eventually he testified against uh, Captain Corey Shaw and um, it died in the infirmary in, uh, in um, Quebec with yeah. fever? Well he died from the frostbite and, and the effects oh, right. of his yeah. um, but uh, what, what, what I meant to say to you was the the um, uh, the surgeon, um, the the brother who was the curate, uh, he he had a he had a, a close relationship with Chambre, the the landlord, hadn't That's he? That's right. Uh, uh, and there's one account of him being um, the the ribbon man who shot Chambre in eighteen fifty two as well. Um, shot at him and, and shot his hat off while he was sitting in the house <laughs> at the fire. But then, but then I suppose you can't really take history out of its context either, because he would have had little opportunity to have anything else other than a close relationship with Sean Bray because That's Sean right. Bray as the landlord really had the, the Protestant clergy in his in his pocket That's you know right. so yeah. they would they would have really had to stand up and take his be on his side anyway mm. so, That's right. you know it may not have been that that might have been its, his natural inclination but it, it, it may not have been no, no you can't judge that either but his uh, he was from McGilligan the uh, in County Derry, yeah. and uh, their father, Sergeant Graham and uh, Reverend Graham's father, wrote um, a history of the Orange Order, which is still available. Uh, so uh, that's a kind of an interesting aside. But uh, eventually, um, he rescued Captain Marshall rescued 127 hmm. uh, passengers and I think nine crew from the from the uh, the ice. Now there was an interesting story there too, Kevin. In that, uh, uh, Shaw uh, actually had reached port. Uh, he he was the, the first to arrive in port, and he declared that uh, everyone on the ship had been lost. That's right. Uh, he and the first and second mate were picked up by a ship called the Margaret Pollock, and um, he arrived in Quebec and he reported that uh, all were lost. That the Hannah was down, and the very next day, Captain Marshall pulled in with the survivors, not all the survivors, he transferred to a few other ships because his, his ship was overboard and, mm -hmm. uh, by them and um, he arrived with uh, 127 passengers. So uh, that was uh, a big uh, blow to Corrie Shaw. Well, Corrie Shaw, it would have suited him better had everyone perished exactly. oh, yeah. because it wouldn't have shown what he had done. And what, 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 what was the... Um, what were the, were the repercussions for Curry Shaw, Una? Well, certainly there was some type of a trial because there is there is reports of of both the sergeant and um, and the captain who had saved them, given evidence against him. But there's there is nothing to show that there was any conviction from it, um, or that that he really suffered anything for what he had done. And in fact, he protested his oh, innocence, he protested didn't he? protested his innocence, yeah. yes, yeah. that, that uh, it wasn't, he hadn't abandoned ship. He had originally gone into the boat to try and get help and to save other people. So, yeah. uh, and, and it's most definitely had the perished, it would have left it an easier story for him. But mm -hmm. it doesn't seem as if he really um, had anything untoward afterwards no, from him. No remorse no, because no. He, he wrote a cheeky letter to the Quebec Mercury, to the paper, you know, justifying About himself. scandalising him. Yeah. And what would be, uh, what is the legacy of the HANA today uh, in that area uh, as, regards, as regards the, the, the survivors and, and what they've left behind them? 
Well, I think the nicest piece is the quote that's on the back of the book where Paddy Murphy had said, we call this place Little South Armagh. Because they have never, that, that group of people as a people have never forgotten the area that they left. And uh, we have photographs in the book from, um, from the graveyards and you could almost transcribe that graveyard and put it into the graveyard in Mullaban because the names are there, the headstones are there. Um, on the 150th celebration uh, last October for uh, St Mary's Church in Mullaban, we unveiled a plaque um, that's on the wall and it's to the survivors of the Hannah. So that we have that link, that permanent link yes. now, I think, between our parish and the parish that yep. they went to. But, you know, I think on what, on, on the honour and the, and the pride that we have in South Armagh for another group of people in a different part of the world to want to call their area Little South Armagh, I think for us was... Yes was really very, very important. Oh, yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. So, so really, it's, it's, Kevin, it's, in, it's really a microcosm yeah. of, of South yeah, Armagh. That's right, because when the people came from there, and several of them have come now, they couldn't believe when they looked in the graveyard. It was exactly the same graveyard as their graveyards in Perth and Westport. And uh, uh, the same names. Yes, and yes. And ironically, you see, the people from the parish of Fark Hill who went out there, intermarried out there, just the same way as the intermarried yeah. here. And uh, just a very recent one, uh, there was a McCann gathering in, uh, in Mullaban, in T. Cullen, uh, there a few weeks ago, and there were 154 people uh, at a meal there. They were from here, from Canada, the States, and so on. But um, these people came, some of the people, McCann descendants from... Um, Westport uh, came uh, to it and uh, uh, they uh, were, I took them around and one of them was living in Ottawa. Uh, she was a Susan Masvall, which wouldn't give you uh, much of a clue of South Armagh, but she was a descendant of this McCann family. And I was in correspondence with a man uh, in uh, Ottawa uh, called Dan Hamilton, whose mother was Powers or Pyers from Anduff. Uh, in um, in our parish and uh, she's 98 years old and she was born in Stanleyville in the same area just beside Westport mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I was telling this woman about it because she now lives in Ottawa even though she's from uh, that area in Ontario and she got in contact with this Dan Hamilton and she's discovered that uh, they're related you say because uh, they, they share the same great-great-grandparents uh, and it's all a, a community very much like here because of intermarriage all that so these links keep going on and every year now and every so often somebody new, new appears who weren't necessarily on the boat but heard of this story and their people may have gone in the 1840s earlier yeah uh, 1830s yeah and they are linking up now as well so um, there's a community, um, uh, this woman, uh, sorry, this man McCann, he's Damien McCann, his people were from, well, man, he lives in Cleveland, Ohio now, but he said his brother went up driving through um, this area, North Crosby, Ontario, around the, the, the Westport, Stanleyville, Perth area, and he stopped on the road and he met two men, and he asked them, uh, said he was McCann, and they were also McCann. And their roots were from from here, and uh, they have up on a, a, a monument there, Little South Armagh. And one of them, he was in his fifties, he said, and he, he said, yeah, I said, I know my people came from all that, but what is this Little South Armagh? <laughs> he, he had lost what exactly uh, this this was, you know. Uh -huh. uh, but he was descended from the McCanns of uh, Shanro Mullaban. So there's a whole community out there and they're beginning to get more and more contact now. So it's, it's a never-ending uh, story. And I think could be replicated maybe all over Ireland because of situation. And from one little oral, uh, little bit of a story... That came down. That came, yeah. Well, Kevin, uh, there's, a lovely, uh, there's a, a lovely, very plain, simple stone uh, out in Cariff, uh, t 
to the Hana. Uh, how did that originate? Hmm. But Mickey McGuigan put that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mickey would have. Um, some of the some of the the people on the boat would have been from the townland of Cariff. Mm. Um, and, and Mickey's and own people Mickey, were on. Mickey's yeah. people were on it. And yeah. the first church, actually, the first mountain church built out there, was built by the McCann brothers, yeah. um, who were from the townland of Cariff. So um, the. Mickey, Mickey McGuigan would have been the man who put the stone up and, and Mickey would do quite a lot of that local history um, that is very, very local to that townland mm -hmm. um, and would be, a, I, th I think, the last person in that area that would have some of those very local oral stories that others may not have. Mm. Um, so Mickey would have always um, commemorated in some way um, anything that would that was there around that history of the Cariff area. Mm. Um, so that's how that one came about. And as I say, then the one that's in the graveyard um, was just put up to, to as part of the celebrations for the building of St Mary's Church in Mullaban, which was 150 years built last well, then year. There was, a, there, there, there was also a house that featured uh, in the documentary. Was that uh, Paddy Murphy's relatives? Yes. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was... That was uh, the house that John Murphy came from, and um, it was known as Michal Owens, or uh, yeah, Michal Owens. The people said, but it was Michal Owens, Michal son of Owen, and uh, Michal Owen died in 1894, and he was a brother of John Murphy on the Hanley, you see, and uh, they lost uh, two children, and this is the the where the story of the twins floating away came from that Murphy family, uh, and um, Paddy Murphy's uh, great great grandfather sorry great grandfather yeah uh, bernard murphy was a two-year-old child and he was pulled out of the water by this mrs grant she thought it was one of her children mm -hmm. but it wasn't it was her neighbor's child and these people were all very close neighbors they were from a, a small group of townlands for example stanleyville ontario is named after the stanley family of fork hill so if you go to fork hill just beyond the church there that's still stanley's hill even though there are no stanley's now in today, Hill, yeah, but th that's what Stanleyville was was named after, you see. So, um, and if you go to that area, they have uh, uh, all the roads are named after the families, and Murphy Road, Burns Road, all that, mm -hmm. Road, all that type of uh, thing. So, um, it's uh, it's a pretty strong link, you know. Very good, very good, but a a, a, a tragic tale, but. Um you know, uh, in many ways, when you listen to uh, what has evolved from it, uh, there has been a lovely legacy, you know. There has, there ha you know, and and even for you know the descendants of Captain Marshall, yep. um, yes, because they had gone in, and um, they had, as as has had Paddy Murphy, they had a part of an oral history that had come down through their family, and um, that they didn't have a lot of bones around either, and they had gone in and found. Um, the famine link book on the internet um, and did some investigation and uh, he, they had actually come here then to meet up with some of the survivors mm -hmm. um, the, the families of some of the survivors that went on on the other side and it was a very I would have to say oh, it, it was, was a very lovely. emotional yep. meeting um, uh, and uh, you well, know mm -hmm. he was very proud I think that Ooh, night yeah. in, in the in the in the chamber. Because he's an evangelical Methodist as well as his uh, great, great, great grandfather William Marshall, you see. And where, so where, where is this man from, Kevin? He, he lives in Wales now, uh, Alan Evans uh, and his wife Barbara, and they came over. And so he, he saw this in the Irish American magazine, in the book, and he rang up T. Cullen, and I happened to be there. Uh -huh. And he he, uh, he said he was descended from uh, Captain, uh, and I thought first it was Corey Shaw, but he said no, he wasn't <laughs> being. But it turned out that Captain Marshall uh, was given an inscribed goblet, about that size, uh, a silver goblet, inscribed for rescuing yeah. uh, these people. And uh, Alan Evans arrived here, with the goblet, right? He still has the goblet and uh, Captain Marsh's portrait. And then I was corresponding with him for quite a while, and um, uh, he he knew that Captain Marshall wrote an autobiography, but he he couldn't get his hands on it. And one day, he thought it disappeared in the London Blitz with his grandmother, but one day he was on to a, a librarian in Bradford, 
and uh, about his research in Methodism uh, himself, you know. And he mentioned to the little librarian, had he ever heard of Captain Marshall? And the librarian said, well, it's funny, two days ago, I had his autobiography in my hand. So he sent me the autobiography, and this is a section of it here, and um, I'll give it to you, uh, uh, where Captain Marshall gives his own account of rescuing the people. So he came over here, and the council put on a civic reception, and we had 31 people who, who had rel from here who had relatives on the boat to meet him. And it was a, it was a very good. It was a very well. It was a very emotional meeting for him. He yeah. really, I think, you know, felt very proud of what Captain Marshall had done, and and, that, and that, rightly so. And that he was there in the area of, that the people had come from. That he could meet a uh, family that were belonging to some of those people, and mm -hmm. you know, even even to be able to trace all of that down to present day is, is quite is quite a wonderful story. Oh, and that's the post story if you like. Yeah. And there are always bits and as Kevin said, the number of people who who have dispersed families um, that are now making contact with each other in Canada because of this yeah. is is a whole other story. That's right. And and in and in the States. Yeah. yeah. Uh, people have got uh, on from Wisconsin because they moved on from Westport by Bullock Cart to Wisconsin, and there's a whole section there who uh, trace themselves back to uh, our parish as well. So they have got in contact, and uh, so the the internet has been amazing. Oh you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're um, it's it's a very uh, it's a massive story. And so it's just like really dropping a stone in in, yeah. in the pond, yeah, and, and the ripples are spread. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and those ripples continue to, will continue to spread. That's you know, right. it, uh, I suppose the putting down of the book or, or the putting down of any story in print is only the start of the any start, story. Yeah. And somebody needs to put that down to cr start that effect to happen. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's really what it was. But it, it would be massive thanks to Paddy Murphy, who's passed oh, away, yeah, passed away. Um, since the book was done. It would be massive thanks to him because um, it could not have happened well, without him. The film was Jane. made by the BBC and yeah. the film of Montreal. Uh, here it was Ice Immigrants by the BBC. And Captain Marshall's uh, descendant, Alan Evans, and his son went out to the ice to film. Yeah, I saw the documentary. Yeah, it, 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 it was it was a powerful, yeah. it was a powerful piece of film, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know just you're after what you're after uh, documenting there, uh, a, a lovely legacy yeah. uh, to those uh, people who who were lost, and uh, as well to the the very necessary survivors who have given us the story uh, that has come down. But earlier, Una, you talked about the sense of identity uh, and and the, the sort of the hidden treasures of South Armagh. And one of the best days that I had in recent years was uh, going on one of the Ring of Gullion trips from uh, the museum here in Newry, and you were the tour guide. Uh, and it really was uh, right from the uh, the drive past the uh, viaduct right into South Armagh. I think there was 23 or 4 stops from memory. And it was a, a really, really enjoyable trip. And uh, th those trips have been expanded in, aren't they? Yeah, well, uh, the Ring of Gullion are, are trying to um, place three or four of them um, every year. And, and I think, you know, possibly it's something that could be looked at then maybe, uh, you know, in some way commercially that people, you know, that they ran maybe even once a month and people could just turn up for them. Uh, you know, I suppose um, for tour guiding or for taking people around, you know, one of my earliest memories is my father standing in an old street in Tully Donnell and looking round and saying, aren't you a blessed people? Now look where you are born. And, and, and it is that sense of, you know, the, the recognition of what you have. You know, I've stood with, with primary seven children um, at Annamar Court Cairn, which is one of the best examples of a court cairn mm -hmm. in all of Ireland. And I've said to them, look, people are coming from Cork and Kerry to come to see this and it's in your field, you know, you own this. And that sense 
of wonder for children to know that they have something that's in their community that other people don't have, that they have to come there to see it. You know, it's something that we need to instill back into uh, our own young people. Yeah. Um, but, but of course, we were very lucky in a, you know, I uh, went around with Una's father, Jim Murphy, and his cousin, Owen Keenan, um, and uh, my own father was also an encyclopedia of the local area, and um, their knowledge was amazing. Like, I mean, they talked about 300 years ago as if it was yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, and then, of course, Michael J. Murphy, uh, the folklorist and writer from Drummond Tay, who uh, did unbelievable work. So we were very lucky uh, to... Um, I think uh, Patrick Kavanagh put it well, these were the last of the uneducated, in inverted commas again, the uneducated intellectuals, you know. Uh -huh. Kavanagh said that about himself. He said, I flew to knowledge without going to college. They had an encyclopedic knowledge of their own uh, area. And I was very lucky to, to, to know them. So, uh, I, I, I call those uh, type of people, uh, and, and I'm very lucky to have access to a, a few of the uh, older people in Uri, uh, I refer to them as walking reference oh, books. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. You know, and uh, the, the, uh, the sad thing is that unless we do what the type of thing we're doing today, uh, you know, when those people pass on, uh, that chunk of history goes with them. Well, we, myself and Una are trying to stay another way, you know. <laughs> but it's about... I think it's about working with with young people yeah. and not, you know, that it's important that if there are historical groups that they don't just talk to other people who know it. You know, it's important that if you're doing history that you do it in a way that's accessible to young people, that you're engaging in young people. You know, if you take a child out and you stand up beside Ballykeel Dolman and you look at the Dolman and you start to talk about fairies or, you know, the first time I went to the passage grave at the top of Sleep Gullion, I didn't know it was a passage grave. I went to the Calia Bearer's house. I went to the old woman's house. Now, that was enough at that stage because at that stage then it was to know what was on the top of Sleep Gullion and to know how to get to it. Yeah. The wider knowledge of it being an actual passage grave exactly on the same uh, lines as Newgrange would come later. It's about engaging with the child. It's about having them in Myra Castle, you know, and, and them saying to you, did princesses live here? It, yes, princesses live there. The yeah. fact that, that it was Lord Mountjoy and that he was chasing Q.O.N.E., yeah, yeah, that yeah. will all come. Yeah. But, but it's about getting them to the places. It's about them being part of that. It's about the, those older people that have that, passing it on. It's about keeping the oral tradition. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the it's key to talking. it is... People have to get into the schools. Primary schools have to take this up, you know. Uh, I've been in one school this year in Drummond Tea, uh, and the, 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 the children, uh, you know, they, they, they love stories. Mm. I mean, yeah. And they're living in the middle of stories. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, uh, you know, that the, the primary schools in South Armagh, and everywhere, of course, should be looking at their own area. And if the teachers don't know enough about it, well, then they can get a few people in who do. Well, it, it, it's significant that you've mentioned that, Kevin, because with the Maritime Group uh, that I'm involved with, we have actually been uh, we, we have been doing just that. Uh, there's 22 local primary schools, and we started off in Fork Hill and, uh, in, back in February, and we have done... I think to date seventeen, uh, as far as Balik. Which is brilliant. Uh, That's great. You know, yep. and 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 we're getting in, and and uh, you realise, as you say, Una, uh, the children when you ask them even, where is the Newry Ship Canal? Show them a photograph of the canal. Where is the Newry Ship Canal? And you're lucky if ten percent of them know, but as soon as you show an image of one of the two shopping centres. Mm. The, and nearly every hand goes mm. up. I go there with mommy and daddy. Yeah. Mm. But they don't know anything about the stretch of water outside they the door. They must be exposed to it, you see. And they, they will not know about their local area unless they're exposed to it. Uh -huh. And this is uh, more and more crucial now with the, the, the worldwide uh, media, you know. Uh, we, we need There's so much going on. That's correct. So we need, uh, it's more and more urgent and the schools have to be involved in this. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will happen 
more and but more. The, the, pro the, the problem is as well that if you have, you know, usually the educator of the local history or the family history um, in any unit is the grandparent. Because, you know, when you have young children, when you're a parent with young children, your focus is, you know, getting them fed and getting them dressed and getting enough money to keep everything right. When you're a grandparent, uh, that, that's a whole, you're looking at, at a third generation and there, there comes that sense of urgency in you to tell, tell them stuff and to tell them about their own local area. Now, if you have a grandparent that doesn't know it themselves, that's entirely lost to that complete family unit. Mm -hmm. And we found that with the townlands, yep. that that was one of the big reasons of starting to put up the townland stones, that you had within e every townland a small group of older people who knew where the boundaries were. Yep. Children might have known their own townland, they may have known that the next townland was that, but they didn't know where the boundaries crossed. They, and so all of that was only in the, in the hands of a handful of people. And if you allowed it to go on, uh, for another 20 years, it would almost be gone. gone. So we put up townland boundary stones. So now as you go through our parish, when you're leaving one townland, the stone tells you the name of the townland you're going into, and if you're coming up the road, it tells you it on the other side of it. So, you know, it's a marker put down there. It has created a whole new sense of urgency around the townlands. So sometimes it's about doing the visual. Uh -huh. You know, putting something there just like it was putting the story of the hand out there and look at what happened after that. It's putting the stone down and create a whole new sense for a whole new generation of people. But, but definitely, you know, Kevin talked about being lucky. We were lucky. We grew oh, up yeah. in houses where that oral tradition was still so strong. Absolutely. That you didn't hear. Nobody sat down to tell you the stories. You heard them that often. There were smaller houses. You were in the one space. People were coming out in. Stories were talked about today, tomorrow, the day before. You heard it so constantly that you felt that you were there when the stories happened. Uh -huh. That's right, because my you know, father talked about a woman in our town land called Mary Lamb. And Mary Lamb had a son called Patrick McGill. And um, he died when he uh, drank a noggin of grots and so on. And I thought my father virtually knew this Mary Lamb and her son, and I knew all about him, and he uh -huh. married and everything. Uh -huh. And um, th I just knew he was maybe before my father's time, but he would point out her house and her well and all this type of thing. And I had a whole story about her and the local landlord and so on. And um, uh, when I got the 1821 census, in 1821, Mary Lamb was 62 years old. Her husband, or sorry, her son was 22 years old. And the stories that I heard about his birth and all were from 1799. It was a shock to me because I thought, well, like my father didn't exactly remember her, but it was close to him. And I nearly could see her. But by 1828, uh, the Tide Plotman books, she was dead. So she was 62 in 1821, and I thought I knew her. But so that, that was, did. and that was to say, we went out, when we went outside Cross with Leonard's children, the first thing my father did was start by Carlos Grove as <laughs> I did Grove, which was a story about the Carlos Mitchells, a football team, and it, and it goes on as a local ballad, it lined out the team. So I knew at that stage when I was born, and this was in the 60s, that it was the Cross Rangers, so I thought the Carlos Mitchells played when my dad was playing football. And when I found out later, the Carlos Mitchells set up in 1889, <laughs> and they were only there for 18 months. <laughs> but I knew all the names. I could, yeah. I could line out the Carlos Mitchells football team. Yeah. And that, again, is going back to the importance of the local ballads. Yeah. Because history books record the big events, you know, but local local ballads and local pieces of poetry record the important local events mm. and the social history of, of an area, you know, so that every child, I'd say if you went into the town of Cross McGlen now, such as their belief in the Cross McGlen Rangers and the ballads that were written down through the years about the Rangers, that if you were picking a young fellow of the day in Cross, he could nearly line out the Rangers team of the 40s, he could, yeah. because it's in the local ballads. 
you know, the, the, the ballad that Michael Waters wrote, had written, uh, who was one of the, the people in jail for the Cross McGlenn conspiracy, he had written a ballad about uh, the landlord putting a clock in Cross McGlenn, a dummy clock. The clock never, the hands didn't move. The people had wanted a clock to put over their meeting house and he had made little of them by putting up a wooden clock with painted hands and Michael Waters had written a ballad about all the other important things that could happen across the world but Cross Midland was a place where time stood still because the hands never moved on the clock. Tended to, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that to this day is still a ballad that people would know. Yeah. You know, you go into you go into to Craigan and people will quote you, you know, the, the piece about Johnson of the Fuse, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, save us from Johnson, Lord of the Fuse. And Johnson hanged Seamus Moore McMurphy in 1750. But that piece, those four lines of that ballad are still known in the area. So, you know, they're the important things at local level is retaining those ballads and, and collating those. Like uh, you can go back, uh, there's a... There's a a mountain in our townland, Carrick and Gavney, where your own ancestors came from. You're mm -hmm. a lucky man. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, Where's the, the money? Mountain, Where's the money, Kevin? <laughs> we, we don't deal in money. We are in higher currency than money. But the, the mountain is called Sleeve Nagapo, Mountain of the Horses, you see. Uh -huh. And my father told a story. It got its name because when the Norman invasion came in 1169, 1170, they pushed up as far as... Uh, Castle Roach, as far as the, the, the border there, which is a border land still. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our people used to sneak down, and the story was told in our house by my father and the other older men, and um, uh, the land was very boggy and their horses would get bogged down. Our people used to sneak up behind them, uh, and he said, you know, they had this armour on them, but underneath the neck you could lift it up and stick in a knife, slit their throats, Topple them off their horses, and our people stole the horses and hid them behind this mountain. And it's still known as Sleeve Nagapo. Now, this is from the 11th, uh, well, 1230 Roach Castle was built. So you're talking about 13th, 12th, 13th century story. And it was told so well around our fireside that I could nearly see the horses. It was that good. So it's just amazing how. Uh, and even today, is it Sleeve and a Gopal? Oh, yes, oh, Sleeve yeah, and a Gopal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Mountain of the Horses. But there's where it got its the name. The name has retained. Yeah. yeah. And that's in uh, just behind where your ancestors come from, is Sleeve and a Gopal. And if you come out someday, I'll take you to the top of it, and we might see horses. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, on that note, Kevin and Una, uh, can I just say thank you very much for giving us a really insightful uh, account of not only the Hana but uh, uh, of, of, of the background to, to the whole uh, awful uh, tragedy. But again, uh, showing us that, that uh, sometimes, as in this case, uh, good triumphs over, over, over evil, you know. So Kevin and Una, thanks very much. Right, James, thanks thank a lot. you. No problem. You Thank you, Kevin.